What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over a more advanced versus end pop-up menu. So we have two menus left to address that we haven't actually uh, finished with our keyboard input. So let's say we play on a map. There's two, imp two menus that we haven't given keyboard input to other than the standard Unreal input. And that is our pause menu and our versus end pop-up or basically end of match results screen. So if I pause my game, I have changed the buttons over in the pause menu, but I can't actually do anything with it yet that is meaningful unless I use the arrow keys, which is Unreal's default implementation for buttons on a widget. However, we have our own custom setup and we want to set that up today. So we're going to skip the pause menu because the pause menu is actually a little bit more complicated. It's really not too bad, but we have to do things a little bit differently because when the game is paused, certain functions can't be implemented the same as when they're not paused. So listening for the input action that we normally do won't actually work here. Anyway, long story short, we're going to go ahead and defeat our opponent. I've made it so the match is only one round by default. That way we can get this over with quickly. Every time I want to show you something, I just have to defeat the opponent one time. There we go. And once we do, we play the little victory animation and this menu pops up in the bottom left hand corner. So now for this menu, we can actually control it with our custom input system. And you can see that it actually changes just like we have all of our other buttons do where we have that blue highlight around our selection. Then I can press the P1's uh, confirm button to actually do the operation like rematch. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be wrapping up that versus end pop up menu with making it work with our keyboard inputs, thus making it easier to work with controller inputs and setting it up to actually look like our stylized menus, not the standard Unreal buttons. So, if you'd like to get caught up in the series, I believe we're on episode 135 of the fighting tutorial. We are pretty far along. We still have a lot to do, but we've come really far from the beginning. So, feel free to check it out and, and get caught up and see everything that we've done and how we did it. Otherwise... You can click this icon in the top right corner right here, which is where we initially made this menu. We are still going to be using this menu and all of its functionality. We're just going to be upgrading it. So anything in that episode is going to lead into today's episode. Everything that we have in there is still valid. Okay. And with that said, we can go ahead and get started. So the first thing we need to do is just go to our actual widget for that. So I have it under blueprint widgets and then I have a versus end pop-up is what I called it and so it just looks like this technically it's the entire size of the canvas with a small little background and three buttons you could set this up however you want as I explain in all the widget episodes of course this is just design so you make it look however you want but just so you're aware and just so you can see what I did I have the same setup that I had before, but I went to each of my buttons, and instead of using the standard Unreal button for the style, uh, specifically for the normal, but you could do hovered, press, disabled, all the other ones as well, I've changed the image from blank, meaning the default Unreal image, and I've made it our button, bar one, button variation one, and I've told the widget to be drawn as an image. So this button should be drawn as an image because if it's a box, remember, it's going to be drawn as the size of the box, but it doesn't actually line up properly uh, based on my specific dimension. So I said to draw it as an image, just like that. That way it's just nice and clean and it's the right size for all of these objects. And now the same is for the other two for character select button. I've gone ahead and selected the button, set our image, and then draw as image instead of box. And same for the main menu button. So very, very simple in terms of design changes. Not much to do there, but just small upgrade to make it look like the rest of our game and actually fit in. So it's not the standard Unreal button. Now, 
Next thing we want to do is actually set up all the logic for our custom input system on our menus. The reason we do this, and we don't just use the standard Unreal system where we can use up and down the arrow keys, is because we want to be able to customize our controls. And so if we customize them and say, I want to use, I'm actually using WASD for my input. So I use WASD to navigate my menus. I don't want to use the arrow keys in this case. With the standard Unreal method, I would not be able to do that. Instead, you actually go through and select each button and it puts that little dotted line over it. Now you can customize that and that's fine. But like I said, we want to be able to put our own controls for them and customize the controls that the players can use on the menus. We've done it for a few of the menus, specifically the character select, the level select, and I believe the main menu. But for any of these menus, you can also use controller inputs. And for that, we don't want to just limit ourselves to the keyboard. So that's another advantage of using this method. All right, so we can go into the graph and take a look at what we have. So this is everything we have in this widget. Most of it is going to be stuff from before. There is one thing that I wanted to point out before we got into this episode on the on press main menu button. This is all logic that we have from the level streaming episodes. Found out I was actually using a different load level from the level streaming interface. I had two functions in this interface and one of them was not being used for anything, but we were calling it at the end. It wasn't really affecting anything because I wasn't going to the screen often, but now that we are going to be using the screen more often and we actually have control over it, we should definitely make sure we get this right. So I deleted the other one that I had. Oh, let me go back in here. You see, I only have load level and skip stage intro. It's all you need now. So I'm gonna get rid of that invalid node and I'm just gonna make sure that mine looks like this. Now it was already hooked up properly, as you could see. I already hooked it up into load level, passing in the get streaming level and the level name. But I just wanted to point that out, <laughs> that that was a remnant from the past that never got solved, or at least never got removed, and so that was kind of ugly just sitting there. So if you have that, just make sure you're using load level in this event. All right, but the good news is the rest of this stuff is good. Everything we're going to be doing is additions, not changes. And that's what we want, because that means that our system is set up and working as intended. All right, so let's do the standard procedure that we do for all of our menus. They're all a little bit different, so I still like to cover them in depth, but it's going to be pretty similar to some of the other custom menu navigation that you've seen throughout the series. So in Event Construct, we have these nodes to begin with where we set the input mode to be game and UI so we can navigate the menu. And then we also set a game mode reference that we use several times in this widget. After that is all new logic. So we're going to be using our revamped logic from our settings menu because it is more, uh, it's easier to implement on new widgets than the older menus like our main menu. So we're going to use kind of a hybrid that's going to be pretty quick to implement. So we'll, we'll get through this pretty quickly. Main thing we want to do is listen for input action and we want to grab all of the actions that relate to what we can do on this widget. This is strictly a vertical widget. We can only go up and down to navigate buttons. There's no left and right on this one. So we can do listen for input action. I'll show you an example. Listen for input action. Target is self. The name of the action is the action mapping in your project settings that relates to this. This can either be your standard like jump events like W game pad left thumb stick up or I actually made independent ones just in case we ever wanted to separate these from each other like for example if we wanted to have uh, menu down different from down in the game based on a controller scheme or some specific device that is being used in the game like a game pad you could feel free to do that so for me I have a unique one or I have menu down P1, menu up P1, and then we have menu confirm P1. And I do label them as confirm P1. So anything with a controller will be able to do this. The P2s that you see in here are specific to keyboard mode hacks, which if you're not familiar is essentially if two players are on one device like a keyboard, we do have to separate the input even though it's one input device. So anything with P1 either works with controller or keyboard. Okay, 
And so you can see those are the three that we'll be using, menu up P1, menu down P1, menu confirm P1. So just make sure you have those or something similar that you can use. And you're going to put in the names here. So menu up P1. For the first one is good. You can say use menu down P1 and menu confirm P1. All right. Uh, and then now you can see all these here. Listen for input action has a callback, which means once this input action is pressed, it will then go ahead and perform a call to this event. So we can call an add custom event. And I've done that from each of these, all three of them, to make a custom event. When you create a custom event, it asks you to put in the name. So I just called it P1 menu up, P1 menu down, P1 menu confirm. But the name doesn't really matter here. We're not going to be calling them from anywhere else at the moment. So you just have to make sure that you drag off the callback, plug it into a custom event, and then we'll have to call the appropriate function when we make them. But we're not, we haven't done that yet. So let's do that now. Okay. So we need to go and we need to make a function for move selection, determine button to focus, display hovered selection, and confirm selection. You can go ahead and plus, press plus function to add these. And we'll start with move selection. So after you've made a function called move selection, we can click on it to go into it. Now, if you click on the function in the list or click on the first node in the function, you'll be able to look at the details of it. We want to add two parameters. We want to have an integer that's a direction. And we want to have a Boolean that is if we should play a sound effect or not. So you can click new parameter twice, add these by selecting integer, Boolean, and then giving them a name. And we're going to use these to determine what node we are on. So we have three buttons on this specific widget. We have rematch, character select, main menu. So we need to determine depending on where we're at, what button we're moving to, and if we can make that move, if that's a legal move. To do that, we have to know two things. We have to know the current button that is selected by the player and the maximum number of selections. So I've also made two variables that are integers. Current P1 selection, which just defaults to zero, and max selections, which defaults to the number of buttons that we can navigate through. I have three, one, two, and three. So I want to default max selections to be three. Think of the direction here as basically up or down. Okay. And this is actually pretty simple, although it looks a little confusing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the current selection we're on and add the direction to it. Then we have to make sure that that direction is both above the lowest value, above or equal to the lowest value, and below or equal to the maximum value. Because we don't want to go out of bounds either direction. We want to make sure we're fitting within the bounds of our buttons. We don't want to be on button four if there's only three buttons, and we don't want to be on button negative one. If the, you know, if it's buttons one through three or zero through two, if you're doing index logic, you don't ever want to go to negative one and you don't want to go above the maximum either way. Okay. So we're going to add our current selection that we're on to the direction that comes in. And we have to make sure a, that that value is greater than negative one and that it's less than the maximum number of selections. You can see it right here, but I like to give an example. So current uh, current P1 selection, integer plus integer. Okay, we want to add it the direction to it, just like that. Then we want to make sure that it is integer greater than integer for negative one. It has to be greater than negative one, and boolean. We want to make sure that it is less than integer less than integer, the maximum selections. Okay, and that's how we do that. Then the result of the and gets brought into a branch node. And only if it's true, 
that it is both greater than negative one and less than the maximum number of selections, we are going to set the value, the result of the addition to current P1 selection. We're just going to update current P1 selection. Okay. And honestly, that's pretty simple. That's actually all we need to do to properly move around, but we do need to display that move to the user. That way they know what button they're on. To do that, I have two functions that are going to be useful here. I have determine button to focus and display hovered selection. So let's go ahead and go to determine button to focus. So make a new function if you haven't already made this one. And for this one, I have an output parameter that I've added, and it is a type of button. So to do this, you can type button and then select button object reference. We're going to basically determine what button it is that we're using and then change the style of it to be our style that has the highlight. That way we can see what button we're currently on. All right. And with that said, so we can go into determine button to focus now that we've created it. It's a pretty simple function here. Basically, we're going to take the current selection that we're on, perform a switch, and since these are never going to move around, we know that we have rematch character select and main menu on this end of match, you know, end result screen. We know exactly what these indices are tied to. So if you take your current P1 selection, do a switch on int, you'll get this node here. Click add pin. Make sure that you have as many elements as you do buttons on your widget. We have three, so zero, one, and two. And then we're just going to take our buttons, as long as they are variables, as long as is variable is checked on each one of these buttons, you'll be able to use them in the graph. We already set that up in a previous episode, so you most likely have that. You can go ahead and drag the buttons into the graph. Literally type return node, add return node, and pass in the button. So what we're doing is we're grabbing the button at this selection, at the current selection the player is on, and returning it so we can then change its style. You'll see the changing style in a second, but the most important part is that we're grabbing the appropriate button right here. So index zero or the top one is the rematch button. So that's the one I want to grab. Index one is the middle one, and that's the character select button. Lastly, index two, that's the main menu button. So that's the one that I want to use for the return. It's also default, which means if it doesn't fall under any of these, you can still make it do something. You can feel free to use this if you want. You shouldn't need it unless you're adding more to this screen and you forget to update this. So it could be good to set up a default such as just automatically go to the rematch, the character select or the main menu. I'll go ahead and default it to the main menu just in case that ever happens where uh, we add to it and we forget, we can easily catch it, but the default technically should not be necessary. All right, let's actually go back into move selection because we called determine button to focus here. Make sure you call this. I know we just made the function, so you might not have called it yet. So just now call it right here after setting current P1 selection, Determine button to focus. It returns a current button, right? And so we need to pass that button into our new function that we're going to make now display hovered selection. So again, if you haven't already done this, make a new function, call it display hovered selection or something similar. And then I have an input parameter that I've called button reference. So see how determine button to focus return a button? Display hovered selection is going to take in a button. Then once you've made this function, added the parameter, you can add it in move selection and literally take the current button return and pass it into the button reference. Okay, so this retrieves the button that we're going to change the style on, and this is actually going to change the style on the button, as well as reset the other buttons that we're not currently on back to their default style. That way, they're not highlighted or outlined anymore. Before we go into display hovered selection, let's just finish up move selection here. So the play sound effects boolean is just a boolean to determine if we should play the sound effects when we move. We have a sound for moving on menus. So if this is true, I just bring it out here. I put it into a branch. If it's true, we play sound 2D and I pass in my sound effect that I always use for moving on these menus. If it's false, we don't do anything. We just ignore it. Now let's go ahead and go into display hovered selection. 
and we'll go from there. So display hovered selection is going to change the style of the buttons to make sure it matches which one is currently selected and which ones are not. So the ones that are not selected should go back to this default gray button state. But if it is selected, it should be outlined or highlighted in blue or however you set it up. That way it we know and the player knows what button is currently selected and they know what they're going to do if they press the confirm button. Okay, so in display hovered selection, we have this button reference. Basically what we want to do is just determine which one of the buttons in the widget is equal to the button that got passed in. It's a very simple way to do this is to essentially add all the buttons to an array and then check against each one independently because we're going to have to go through each button anyway and reset them to the default style if they're not the one that's currently selected. So we can knock all this out in one loop at one time by doing the following. Grab all your buttons. I got rematch, character select, and main menu. Drag off of one of them and type make array. It will automatically make an array of the type that you give it. So this is a button object reference. So it's going to make an array of button object references. Click add pin for all the buttons that you have and add them all to this array. There we go. So that's what I've done right here. Now I want to loop through this array and check against the button reference I got passed in. Remember, this button reference is the button that we were found to currently be on based on this integer current P1 selection. So as we move, this integer changes. And then it can be used to determine what button we're currently over top of. All right. So if you drag off the make array, you can do a for each loop to get this guy. And we need to check each array element, or essentially each button, against the button object reference. Okay, so drag off array element, type not equal, not equal object to get this node. And we're going to pass in our button reference. So if it's not equal, this means this is not currently the button that the player is hovering. And because of that, we want to reset its style back to the standard default state the gray button that you see here with no outline, no color. So to do that, what we do is we take the array element that we're on, okay? And we drag off of it. You can drag right off array element, type set style. And you can use either of these. The one that you see me using is the dark blue, the set style where I can actually control everything about the structure. And then I split the struct pin on the widget style. And specifically, we're worried about widget style normal here. So I split the struct pin there. And you can see that I changed my image to my standard button, which is button variation one. And then I make sure to draw the widget style as an image, not a box. Okay, and that's what I've done here. Now, if this branch returns false, this means that the array element here Okay, the array element we're currently looping through, one of these three, is equal to this button reference. That means we found the button that we are currently hovering. Well, we don't want to set it to the default value. Instead, we want to set it to our hovered button value. For me, again, this is an outline around the button. It's a blue outline. That's how we know what button we're currently on. So the false should then set the button to that style. As you can see, I take my array element, okay? I do the same thing where I set style, but I change the image to the button P1 selected. It's a little small, but it's this guy here. So it's gray with a blue outline. Then I make sure to draw as an image still. And with that, when we move around, we will now get the appropriate button, set that button to have an outline so we know what button we're on and then reset all other buttons that way they have the default style this makes it so the player knows exactly where they're at at all times all right now that we have that set up we have one more function to create and that is the confirm selection function so you can make a new function call it confirm selection it does not take in any parameters you can go into it there's one thing I'm going to do here, which is play a sound effect. There's not a case where I don't want to play the sound effect. You could 
set it up however you'd like. So, you know, feel free to use that Boolean play sound effect here. But for me, anytime I press confirm, I'm going to play the confirm sound. So it's as simple as that. I just play sound 2D with my confirm. And then I have three things that I can do on confirm because I have three buttons. So each one of these buttons does an action. This starts the match over. This brings us back to the character select, and this brings us back to the main menu. Now, before we do this and confirm selection, let's go back to the event graph. We actually have logic for pressing the rematch button. So either with a controller, with default Unreal functionality, or by clicking it with a mouse, we can actually trigger the rematch button now by doing any of those things, just not with our custom system. We can also do it with the character select button and the main menu button. So we have two options here. We can either make another event that we add and do the same logic to, like selected rematch here. And what that means is if we use our actual button that we use for confirm in our custom system, for me it's the one key on the keyboard, or the bottom face button on a gamepad, such as Xbox's A button, now, you can use both methods if you want. You can leave them both plugged in. It won't really hurt anything. But at this point, you can actually disable the other ones if you'd like. Just disconnect the pin and only allow this option. And that'll make a little bit of, that'll make a few things smoother. So if we disconnect all of these, I'll show you at the end, we will still be able to uh, perform all of our, our options normally. It's just that we'll be doing it with our custom input and not on Rails input or not by clicking. So it's up to you how you want to handle that. Again, I actually support clicking in the series just because I click a lot of times just for convenience when I'm going through it. But you may not want these at the end. That way you have more control over the game itself. So I'm going to plug them in just because I use them. But feel free to disconnect them. You won't need them after we finish this next part. However, the main point of what I'm trying to say here is that we have these this logic in here already for rematches. Going back to the character select and going back to the main menu. Since we have them, we don't have to rewrite them. But what I did is I made three custom events, just like we did above, add custom event. And then I called one selected rematch and plugged it into the rematch logic that we already had. Then I had another one that I called selected character select and plugged it into the character select button logic. Finally, I made one called selected main menu and plugged it into the main menu button logic. Okay, and that's so in the confirm selection, if we go back into that, we can now call each of those events when we press the appropriate button. So confirm selection is pretty simple. What I'm going to do is just like on move selection when we were trying to determine what button we want to use, we want to use our current P1 selection to see what button we're currently on. And then we want to perform a switch statement on it. Now, again, we know index 0, or the top button, is the rematch. Index 1, the character select, is this. Index 2 is main menu. So, index 0 calls selected rematch. Index 1 calls selected character select. Index 2 calls selected main menu. And again, feel free to add a default. I will also default it to the main menu. Okay, and that's pretty simple. Now the last thing we have to do is actually call each of these functions when they are pressed from the listen for input action. So starting off, listen for input action, P1 menu up. So when we press the up key, we want to call move selection here. Okay, we press the up key, we want to move up. It's that simple. Now we have to fill out the parameters that we want to use. When you first drag this onto the graph, you're going to have the defaults, which are zero and false. For up, I want to say negative one. I know it's a little bit weird. Usually in programming space, moving down, you know, everything starts at the top left. So moving down is usually positive. So for me, moving up is a negative one value. Then I do want to play the sound effects. So I check that. Now, menu down is the opposite. It's going to be a direction of one because we're moving the opposite direction. And we still want to play sound effects. For confirm, we want to just call confirm selection. There's nothing to pass in there. At the very end of all this, I actually call move selection by default. 
but I don't have play sound effects enabled. So direction is zero. Don't move it any anywhere. Keep it at the default state it's on and don't play sound effects. The reason I do this is just so that I can get the outline around the initial button without having to move. By calling move selection, but not giving it an actual value that changes it from the default button, it's going to then go through all the logic in move selection, which remember, actually highlights the button and gives a little blue outline to it. But we don't want to play sound effects because the user did not move, so it'd be a little bit weird to hear the move sound effect. All right. And with that said, you're good to go. Now we only have one menu left that is not normalized to our custom input system. So we will have to update everything to work with controllers. There are a few a few things that we haven't finished that yet. But for everything that we have in here, other than the pause menu, we are good to go on keyboard with our custom input system. But anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you learned a little bit about menu customization and a custom input system for your menus, specifically for the end result screen of a match. If you did, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. And I really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support. Thank you for continuing to give me encouragement and get excited about this game because I get excited about these tutorials and I'm, I'm glad that you guys do as well. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. I'd be happy to help you out and assist with any of the issues that you had. Anyway, guys, like I said, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.